Hi guys, it's Olivia here from Olivia's Catastrophe and today I'm here to give you my April wrap up. In the month of April I successfully completed my 30 books in 30 days challenge and I mostly stuck to my TBR and I'm here to tell you about all 30 books that I read this month. I'm not going in chronological order but I want to talk about Six of Crows by Leigh Bardugo first. This one is a very popular book on booktube and it is following a gang of criminals who go on a heist to break into one of the most secure places they possibly can in this magical world. I really, really enjoyed this one and actually it became a new favourite. In my vlog I do mention that I have some reservations about making this a new favourite, it's not because I think it did everything perfectly, it is a flawed book, but it was just so much fun and I had all those emotions of fangirling after reading it that I had to give this book five stars. It takes place in Ketterdam which is essentially a magical Netherlands and I absolutely love that element of it and we follow this different crew of criminals and there were some characters of this criminal gang that I liked more than others. I was not a huge fan of Kaz, I felt like he was too closed off from us as readers as well as from the people who are members of his gang and I didn't understand how they all trusted him so much because he showed no reason to actually have developed such so much trust from them. I also was very skeptical as all of these characters are supposed to be about 15 or as teenagers yet they all talk like and act like adults and I didn't really believe their ages at all. However there was somebody who rescued this story for me and that was Jesper. I found his character to be fantastic. I give a list of reasons why I love Jesper in the vlog so I won't go into that here but Jesper and Nina really carried this book for me. There were some other characters I didn't like like Matthias but that's just a story for another day. All in all it was really good. I felt like the first half was a bit slower than I expected for a book that's supposed to be a heist and so plot driven. It really delved into their backstories in the beginning and it kind of weighed the story down. It wasn't as fast paced but then the second half was everything I wanted from a heist book with a fast paced plot that just encaptured me completely and I needed to know how it would end. I was able to predict some things. Lee Bardugo leaves clues and I felt like she was a bit obvious with her clues so I was able to predict quite a bit of this book but it didn't matter that I found it predictable because I was still able to enjoy it quite a lot while reading. Moving on we have When Dimple Met Rishi by Sandra Manon and this was another new favourite. That's two of my five stars right when we get into the video. In this one we follow Dimple and she is someone who's really into coding. She really wants to win a competition which involves coding and she has to go on this program and her parents really want her to get married or to find the person she is going to get married to whereas Dimple is not interested in that at all. However her parents do send her there with the intention of her meeting a certain someone and that someone in particular is Rishi and this is when Dimple met Rishi and what happens at that coding program. I thought this one was just an absolutely adorable cute contemporary. It's a rom-com so it does have some funny moments in there but it also has some really adorable ones. I really felt like Rishi and Dimple both developed a lot and this book really touches on a lot of themes like different ones where it comes to class and money and then to discrimination against minorities. I appreciated that Dimple was into coding and Rishi was into art. Those hobbies are very at the very much at the forefront of this book and discussed about whether you can actually make a career out of being into art or if you can't and things like that. Basically there was so much about this book that I liked, the parental relationship, it could just do no wrong and I was smiling so much by the end of it and it wasn't as predictable as I thought it was going to be for a contemporary. So this one is definitely one you should read. Everybody was right when they recommended it to me. My buddy read When Dimple Met Rishi with Gaia from Gaia Athena. Moving on I want to talk about A Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula K Le Guin and I read this for Le Guin Along which is hosted by Ashley from A Frolic on Fiction and she's got some other guest stars who will be there with her and I really did enjoy this book. I have read Ursula K Le Guin before and I liked A Wizard of Earthsea. I think the best way to describe it is a quiet book. It's about a wizard who makes a big mistake and kind of spends the rest of his life trying to resolve it. I don't think I can give you a better description than that but if you're looking for a big magical adventure with lots of all-out battles and lots of magical creatures this is not it. While he does fight a dragon he's more likely to use words then weapons to fight a dragon and he is someone who develops a lot in the story. You'll find Jed to be very unlikable in the beginning but he's so likable by the end. I really enjoyed all the magic. I loved the friendship 
that the main character has with Vetch. I just thought it was a really good book but it's slow paced. I described it in my vlog as a cross between The Alchemist and Lord of the Rings but better than Lord of the Rings and that's what I'll stand by. Next up we have The Sin Eater by Megan Campisi and this was recently gifted to me by Pam Macmillan Australia which I talk about in my Australian haul. However I've read this one and I think the synopsis that I gave in my haul does not quite match up to the book. So yes we are following a Sin Eater and those are people who eat the sins of those who have sinned. So for example, if you die, you can tell the Sin Eater, well, not if you die, then you're dead. If you're dying, you can tell the Sin Eater, I have lied, I have cheated, and I have pickpocketed. And then you can, and then the Sin Eater will tell you, I need to eat lamb, grapes, and butter on your grave. And that's what the Sin Eater does. And then your soul is lighter and you can go up to heaven. So that's essentially what a Sin Eater does. And it follows this girl who gets chosen to become a sin eater and she has to eat some sins for people in the royal family yet there is a big conspiracy going on and she decides she needs to find out what happened in this conspiracy i buddy read this with the feminist reader on instagram and we both really enjoyed this one i feel like again it's a slow and steady book but it's so immersive the writing style just sets the perfect atmosphere and tone for this historical fiction conspiracy book the plot was interesting. I felt like one plot point was rushed at the end, but other than that, I really was digging the plot. But most of all, I loved the character and how she develops through this, how she goes through highs and lows of being a Sin Eater because it comes with major trials and tribulations. I just thought it was very believable, really in depth, and it just it captured my whole heart while reading. I really did enjoy this book and definitely recommend it. Then I want to talk about Dreamology by Lucy Keating and this is a young adult contemporary. We follow Alice and as long as she can remember she dreams of the same boy each night and they go on dates and they have such a great time. Basically her dream guy. But when she moves house and she goes to her new school there is her dream boy sitting in the class and it turns out he is real. So this book is basically following the connection that those two characters have and whether it truly is her dream guy, is he real, was she just fabricating all of it. Basically I don't want to tell you any more than that because that's what the story is about but I really did enjoy this. I thought it was adorable and cute. I really liked all of the characters. I really liked the concept of dreams and where this book went with that. However I do think the dream plotline was rushed a little bit at the end and things were resolved too easily but that said I didn't even mind because I was digging the characters I was digging the conflict that this book has going in it for herself and how she needs to grow and I really like the friendships I actually ship her with another character than the one that she ends up with but there's no love triangle really then we have Airhead Runaway by Meg Cabot and this is the third book in the Airhead series and I did not like this book at all. So in the first book the person that we follow is M, and she goes to a party? A like show thing? I don't know how to explain it. But she goes somewhere where there is a model who is very famous, Nikki, and a TV crashes down and is about to hit her younger sister so she dies in the way and gets knocked in the head by this massive falling TV and her body essentially dies but her brain is still alive. At the same time Nikki has, uh, Nikki the famous model has a brain aneurysm or something and they do a quick procedure which ends up with M's brain in Nikki's body. However there's a lot more going on in Nikki's life. It's very dramatic and being a model is not easy while trying to solve a conspiracy. This is the last one in the series and I read the series 10 years ago so I didn't quite remember everything that happened in books one and two. Wikipedia helped me and then I remembered a lot more but I had a lot of problems with this book. I found that it was so far-fetched and unbelievable that I couldn't wrap my head around it. I also found the main character to be very two-faced. She complains about being beautiful but then when it comes to an opportunity where she might end up being ugly she doesn't want to do it and she's talking about the benefits to being beautiful and I just found that very two-faced. She also throws around the word love a lot. She says oh I love him, oh I love him and everybody falls in love really quickly and it doesn't feel genuine or real so basically I just found this to be so unbelievable and I didn't like the main character they talk about feminism but then they just do things that don't really vibe with feminism to me it was just a bit it was a bit outrageous and just not really my kind of book then towards the end of the month I read Attack on Titan by Hajime Ishiyama and I have watched the anime for this so I kind of knew what was going to happen in volume one however I did really like reading the 
manga. So in this one we follow this post-apocalyptic world where humans have to live behind this huge barrier because there are titans on this earth and the titans main goal in life seems to be eating humans. Yet this book begins when the titans have started to breach the walls that protect the city and they need to do something about it. The anime is A plus and fantastic and while I did enjoy this manga because I know I like the characters already, I know I like the plot which is genius and I love how it's action and so emotional at the same time. Action can sometimes devolve into being all of this fighting and all of this these cool scenes where the emotion is not really plunged in there but in Attack on Titan it perfectly combines the emotional side of things with the action scenes and that's one of my favourite things about the series. However I do think this book does quite a few jump cuts which can get confusing if you haven't already watched the anime and sometimes it's hard to see what is actually happening during the action scenes in the manga so I'd actually recommend watching the anime and then reading the manga kind of like I'm doing at the moment. Next I want to talk about the three books I read from the Chronicles of Narnia. I did not finish the series but I read Prince Caspian, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader and also The Silver Chair. So let's run through them. First we have Prince Caspian and this was one I really did enjoy. I'm not going to really tell you the plot of any of these but collectively they follow these children who end up disappearing into this magical world called Narnia and while they're in Narnia they end up going on different quests or adventures. So Prince Caspian I essentially knew what was going to happen because they have seen the film but I found it to be such a fun adventure. It was a little bit slow paced in the first half because it's more of a travel story in that point but then towards the end it got a bit more action-packed and a bit more magical and I really did enjoy it. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader was one I liked a little bit less but I still managed to enjoy. It was very much an adventure travel story so they tend to be on a boat in this one and they go to different islands and at each island they have a different adventure. Again I liked it but I did think it was not as interesting as the other ones. And then lastly we have The Silver Chair by C.S. Lewis and in this one we don't have any of the original gang that you see in the first three books. There's a second book where the gang aren't there at all and I also didn't like that one. So you can see the trend that when we get characters who are not from the original gang I am less interested and that's because the sibling dynamic is gone, it's more about friendship and in this one I don't particularly like these two main characters. I feel like they still have a lot of developing to do which they do do across the course which they do do which they do develop across the course of the book but still it just wasn't a particular favourite. It had some cool adventures but they didn't really intrigue me. It was less of a travel, 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 adventure here, adventure there kind of book but still it didn't intrigue me as much. But what I can say for all three of these books is that reading these as a Christian is definitely interesting because for me I felt like the Christian imagery was very obvious and very in your face but I have mentioned on Instagram that while I found the Chris Christian imagery really obvious, I asked people who have read the series who aren't Christian and they said they couldn't gather any of the Christian imagery or messages. So I feel like it's depending on how much you expect the Christian representation to be in here that you can see it, but if you don't expect it or you're not looking for it, I guess you can miss it. And that means you can enjoy these as religious middle grade books or you can enjoy them just as fantasy adventure. Next up I'm so excited to talk about the first five books in the Kathy Cassidy Chocolate Box Girl series. These I reread half of them and read some new ones because I'd read Cherry Crush which is book one, Marshmallow Sky which is book two and Summer's Dream and Coco Caramel before when I was younger and then I just got distracted by more mature young adult. However I read Sweet Honey for the very first time and this is back on my list as one of my new favourite series because I just loved reading them and I'm going to tell you what they're all about. So this is a middle grade slash young adult series. We start with middle grade as they're very young and then they get older and in this one we follow this these two families essentially who are becoming one family. Paddy and Cherry lived somewhere in England and they didn't have the best life. They came from uh, not that much money. And then we also have Tanglewood and the Tanburys, which are a family of a mother and four daughters who have recently gone through a divorce. When the parents start dating, Cherry and Paddy move up to this wonderful place where they get to 
live with the family. So in this, across these books, I definitely say that the themes of divorce and combining two families really runs through it. Honey, the oldest daughter, is especially finding it difficult to move on. She misses her dad and she doesn't trust Paddy and Cherry. She wants them out so her dad can come back and join the family again. So it's definitely about combining the two families. I'm going to talk about each one individually because they all have their own plot lines as they follow different siblings in the books. So we first start with Cherry Crush and we follow Cherry who is half Japanese and she she likes to tell stories. She has a very creative imagination and she gets in trouble often for telling these creative stories which she can't see as lying because it's just storytelling and making her life more interesting, embellishing it. But she decides she wants to stop telling tales when she moves to join her new family in Tanglewood because she just wants to blend in and finally feel like part of the family. However, the oldest sibling in the family, Honey, decides that she hates Cherry and has it out for Cherry, which is not very good because because she's starting to fall for Honey's boyfriend. I was very impressed with this book because it managed to not do any cheating while she's falling for her stepsister's boyfriend and I felt like I related to Cherry. I could remember what happened in this book so I'm not going to say the plot was too surprising for me but I immediately loved the setup. I loved Paddy being so passionate about his chocolate business and I loved the setting and the siblings. I just thought it was a really really good book. Then we move on to Marshmallow Sky and this one was another one I just really liked. I would still say it's kind of upper middle grade young young adult and we follow Sky, who is a twin who's very interested in history. She's struggling a bit because while she's twins with Summer and Summer is very very much seen as the perfect child. She feels like she wants to be independent and do her own thing. She doesn't always want to be in Summer's shadow. So while they are identical twins, she wants to be her own person. Her friends are about 12, 13, and they're all getting into boys. However, Skye has no interest in that. She's much more interested in solving the family's history mystery. And I thought it was a really good job of showing how you don't have to have a boyfriend to grow up and feel mature. And I really liked how she was starting to develop her own independence. Again, while these books do switch focus on different siblings, we can still see Cherry and Honey struggling to accept each other. This book does a good job of having an overarching plot that does connect all of the stories. So I really liked that aspect of it and how they're struggling with the change that their family brings. I felt like this book got a bit cheesy within the last two pages alone, but it was still really good in my opinion. Then we move on to Summer's Dream and this was another book that got five stars from me and is an absolute new favourite and my favourite of the series so far. So in this one we follow Summer who is very ambitious and she wants to be a ballerina. She's very much aspiring to be one especially now that she has a chance where she might be able to go to a professional ballet school but everything is not going well. Her family seems to be falling apart, her older sister Honey seems to be spiralling because of the divorce and these families coming together and in order to be perfect, Summer decides that she needs to eat less and less so she can have the ballerina body. So, I have trigger warnings down below for everything that this book deals with, but there's no surprise it does deal with eating disorder and it deals with it heavily. I found this one very, very emotional and I didn't expect it to be so blatant and upfront about an eating disorder for such a young age audience, but I guess it is a problem, especially for those age audiences. It can be when girls are being a bit more critical of each other's bodies and etc etc. So I felt like it handled the eating disorder side of things very sensitively and realistically. Summer's also struggling from Sky seeming to be different and not being focused on her. Summer has a boyfriend when she starts at the beginning of the novel but she finds out that her boyfriend is not really what she wants. She's not sure she's ready for all of this grown-up stuff of having a boyfriend and leaving home to go to this boarding school even though it's everything she's dreamed of. And I can really rate relate to Summer struggling to always be the perfect child and also struggling with her ambition but not knowing if she's ready or not. I was just relating to Summer an awful lot even though Summer is a 12 to 13 year old girl. Anyway, I just thought this book was fantastic and speaking of these two, we have a male side character in this one who is in the background of each of these books and yet you can still see his storyline and him developing across these two books and that impressed me a lot too. Moving on, we have Coco Caramel, which is the one that follows Coco, who at this point in the series is now 12 years old. I would classify this one as a middle grade. Coco is the youngest of all of them, including Cherry, and she feels like she's had enough of being the youngest. People don't take her seriously. She just cares about saving endangered, endangered species and looking after animals. She finds out that a horse is being abused while she's taking horse riding classes, and she decides that she wants to rescue this horse, and this boy gets in the way at school who seems to be really troubled and doesn't like anybody. 
Again, I thought I was not going to like this one because it focuses on animals and animals are not my favourite thing to read about and yet I really did enjoy it. It does again come with some trigger warnings. Again, it managed to shock me that it dealt with such a heavy topic, which I won't name because some people might consider it a spoiler. But yeah, I was able to predict this one. Again, it was still a reread so I think I was remembering from the past rather than it being too hard too easy a plot twist to predict. Coco grows up a lot in this book. She's also not ready for romance like Sky was, so I appreciated a no romance book. Can't really say much more, but it was really good. And yet we go to my last five star of the month and that was Sweet Honey by Kathy Cassidy. This one is definitely a young adult novel because Honey is 15. This one takes place in Australia for quite a lot of it and I appreciated that so much because since coming back from Australia I've definitely felt homesick for Australia in some ways, dare I say homesick, even though I was only there for nine months. But yes, I was feeling homesick for Australia and you get to see some of the Australian sites and settings in this one. It's not at the forefront of the novel but it's still ingrained there ingrained in the book. Honey is a train wreck and she decides she's going to turn her life around. However, turning your life around is quite hard when you are being cyberbullied and stalked. So this one, it deals with cyberbullying and stalking, as I just said, and I felt like it handled that side of things well, but I especially, especially appreciated how it handled divorce, because especially in Summer's Dream and this one, these two girls are the ones who really feel a connection to their father who is no longer with them, and they're really struggling with melding the families together getting used to having Paddy and the mum around together and Honey especially has been a nightmare throughout all the previous books. It was so interesting to see behind the scenes of what she's thinking and what she's been through and she's just got a really cute boy in this book who I just adored so much and then she's got some really good friends. She's really struggling but she's really trying and I appreciated seeing a character who's really trying their best to turn everything around because boy can that be difficult to do. All in all, that series just made me so happy, made me feel so many emotions, and therefore it's one of my favourites. I've got one more book in the series to read, and hopefully I can get to that next month. On a similar note of rereading childhood favourites, I read The Falling Fast series by Sophie McKenzie, which starts with Falling Fast, then you have Burning Bright, then you have Casting Shadows, and lastly you have Defy the Stars. So I read the first two when I was younger, stopped reading, got distracted by other young adult books like Twilight, and then continued on with this series just now. I did not like this series, I had a lot of problems with it, and the main one is that the relationship in this is very, very toxic, and they try to pass it off as well, they mention it being toxic and yet River still does all the things that everybody tells her not to do time and time again. I'm not going to talk about these books individually because actually they're very, very repetitive. All of the first three books seem to follow the same plot. Basically, they all start and end at the same place and that repetitivity was exhausting. River meets Flynn and Flynn has anger management problems and she just decides that she wants to kind of help him through that while also having a romantic relationship. However, her parents do not approve in the slightest and a lot of her friends do not approve either. And yet she still continues to do the same thing and Flynn continues to be the person that he is and River continues to be ignorant of everybody else. She does a lot of things that I find harmful ideas to promote such as getting drunk when she gets ignored by her boyfriend and just putting herself in lots of positions of danger when she has a bad experience with her boyfriend and I feel like her boyfriend was problematic in that he does have anger management, he knows it. In the beginning he comes across as someone who's trying to do something about it but then towards the end it just becomes a huge mess, the parents are angry, yet she's always disobeying her parents, never telling them where she is or what she's doing, and I feel like the reconciliation between her parents or any discussions that she has with her parents were just not enough to signpost that this behaviour is bad and dangerous. All the times where she gets drunk off her face because something bad happened in her life, it doesn't the book doesn't call out that behaviour and she doesn't change that behaviour, it's still part of who she is by the end of it. So I just felt like it was exhausting to read these three books. At some point I thought the series was getting better but then it just relapsed into the same thing. The last book, Defy the Stars, is quite different because it suddenly becomes an action book. So I just thought it was a bit outrageous, far-fetched and unrealistic and I was not about the series and the way it ended I could see it coming, it was predictable and it was absolute rubbish. Nothing gets resolved in this book or reconciled in a way that I would want. This series don't recommend it. Moving on, I read Stories from Arendelle which is a Frozen short story collection. I don't have much to say about this, it just follows the two main characters doing some pretty cute stuff. It was funny, it was entertaining, I liked it more than I thought and it did have some good messages in there although it does overuse exclamation marks and always talks about how pretty the 
two princesses are. We know they're beautiful, you don't have to yell it at us all the time. Then I want to mention the only new adult romance I read this month and that was American Sweethearts by Adriana Herrera. I had five five stars this month because that was also a five star read from me. I forgot about that one. It was fantastic. This is the end of the American Dreamers series. So it's just the last book of a series that I've loved from beginning to end. In this one we follow Juan Pablo who's getting his story and he has had an on and off relationship with Priscilla for years however their last argument was a final one and they said no we're not going to be doing this anymore and yet when they have to get together for a wedding sparks fly and they start to consider having a another relationship or another go at their relationship Juan Pablo has definitely changed his story, he has developed a lot behind the scenes that we don't get to see and he's ready to start again and yet Priscilla, who is this independent strong woman, is now suddenly struggling with her job. She doesn't know if she wants to keep going and working in this profession and at the same time she's worried that if she drops her job and tries her side hustle, which is quite unique, that she would lose some of her independence, need to start relying on her friends more, maybe start relying on Juan Pablo more, she's not sure if she's ready to lose that level of independence. I thought this book was just fantastic. First of all we get a wedding that's set in the Caribbean. I am all for that. I love weddings in my books. This was the second book where I got to read a wedding and I was so happy. Also it's a wedding of some of the characters we've met in previous books so that was all the more of a reason for me to feel all the feels while we were there. I thought that the romance between them was very very good and the explicit scenes were definitely very steamy and well written. At the same time I can relate to Priscilla about being independent and wanting to be seen as independent while still needing to trust and rely on your friends from time to time. Those things are not mutually exclusive. You can be both of them and Priscilla definitely needs to learn that. I loved how her character developed but I also loved how it was talking about black and brown people who go to therapy, who discuss and talk about mental health. You don't get to see that too much in books and I know it's sometimes a struggle to do in real life as well in black culture but it was nice to see that being discussed openly. You get props for that, you get props for the LGBT plus representation. We have got a bisexual main character in this relationship that is male-female. I also like some of the little mentions such as Priscilla putting on a silk pillowcase or putting on a shower cap before going in the shower. These are parts of black culture that don't get mentioned in books but are very much ingrained in the culture and it just made me so happy to read this book. It was the cutest thing, it was the cutest end to a series ever. Let's continue. And now for the last part of this wrap-up I'm going to be talking about some of the classics that I read this month. I'm going to start with The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. This was a book that I've been meaning to read for a while and I'm glad I finally got to do it. It's kind of a classical science fiction-y kind of book but it's definitely a monster kind of book where you have a main character who's a monster. It follows The Invisible Man and what he does while he's invisible and we do get an explanation for how he became invisible as well. I don't want to say too much but if you liked Frankenstein I'd recommend it and if you liked Frankenstein but didn't enjoy some of the naturey, philosophical deeper parts you'll like this one because it's much more just about the actions that the invisible man does and yeah it's very much an active kind of story. I feel like it doesn't run too deep but it's just a lot of fun to read and such a creative concept that I was smiling while reading it. Really really enjoyed this one. Need to read more HG Wells. I then read three Sherlock Holmes books and I listened to them all on audio by Stephen Fry. These were the last three so now I've read all nine of the Sherlock Holmes books and I just want to quickly say that the best way I think you can consume these books is by audiobook because when you listen to it it's more like you are watching BBC Sherlock or you're watching one of the Sherlock adaptions and the characters come to life whereas I think if I read the actual physical book it would come across as quite dry to me and I'd be a lot less interested so that's just a note are recommending the audiobook, especially the one read by Stephen Fry. So the first one I read was The Valley of Fear, which is the last novel I needed to read, and in this novel it's a classic murder mystery with Sherlock and Watson. However, I found part one to be really interesting and following the classic mystery and getting their friendship, which was enjoyable, and then part two delved into a lot of info dumpy backstory that we didn't need. So if you do want to read The Valley of Fear, I'd actually recommend you just read part one, and then when you get to part two just DNF the book. You, you literally don't need it. 
I also read The Return of Sherlock Holmes, which is a short story collection that happens after a big event that happens in another short story collection. And I really, really enjoyed that short story collection. I felt like it showed the connection between Watson and Sherlock so well. It had some really good mysteries in there and it was just very enjoyable to listen to all of those short stories. And then last but not least, I read His Last Bell, which is again a collection of short stories. And you can read these books in different orders, but I would recommend finishing with His Last Bell because the last short story in His Last Bell is such a, a bittersweet story that seems like a very good place to end all of the Sherlock Holmes and Watson stories together collectively. While it wasn't my favourite short story collection because there were some that I just wasn't interested in, and to be honest they felt a bit repetitive, it still was good enough for me to just be satisfied to end the Sherlock Holmes reading there. Overall, up and down with these books, I rated one of them one star and the highest it's got is four stars, so it's definitely been an up and down ride. Some of them are a bit racist, some of them aren't. Mixed bag, but I do like the characters quite a lot. Then I want to talk about the three Henrik Ibsen plays I read. So the first one I read was Ghosts, and the fact that I can't remember what Ghosts was about already shows that it's not that memorable, it's not that wowing. I thought it was okay as far as I remember, and I felt like it didn't do a very good job of representing disability. I remember thinking that when I was reading it, but I can't remember why. But that's not really helpful for you guys, I'm sorry, but I just don't recommend Ghost by Henrik Ibsen. However, I then read Heather Gabler and I really did enjoy that play. It has a female villain character and it really talks about greed and wanting to put yourself at the top of your career path and what you have to sacrifice for that, what you can't sacrifice. And I found the ending to be quite shocking. Again, with all of Henrik Ibsen's plays, he has quite shocking endings and I'm gonna leave trigger warnings down in the comment box down in the description box below. And then last but not least, I ended on The Master Builder by Henrik Ibsen, and the whole time I was reading it, whenever I heard the word Master Builder, I kept thinking of the Lego movie. But as for the play itself, it follows the Master Builder, who comes across as a very unlikable character. You might still think he's unlikable by the end, you might not, I'll leave that for you to discern. But I found this to be a very clever play, because with each character that's introduced, we get a new perspective on the Master Builder. You see him in a sympathetic light, you see him in a light of someone who hates him, and I just felt it was a great way to layer his character and really bring a lot of depth. It deals with grief, it deals with ambition, and I felt like it handled those themes really really well. And then lastly I have two Lord Byron plays that I read. The first one was Cain and as you can tell from the title it follows the story of Cain and Abel which is a biblical story but in play form. It's kind of like Paradise Lost like I would read Paradise Lost and then move straight on to Cain by Lord Byron which is what I did because it follows after the events of Paradise Lost and you can kind of connect the two even though they're by different authors and in Cain I really liked the themes of good and bad. I really liked seeing the sibling relationship and the tensions that were there and I also think it was really interesting to see this perspective of the devil or, or Lucifer who said he wasn't the one who did the things of the Garden of Eden and then he gives like justifications and such. I just found it such an interesting play, really interesting to read and the ending was just as satisfying as I thought it would be and then last but not least after that I read Manfred by Lord Byron and this one follows a suicidal man who says that he's done something terrible and that's the reason why he wants to commit suicide which is essentially the plot of this book so the trigger is fairly obvious for this one and while the play does give hints for the reasons why he feels suicidal I don't particularly like that play because it doesn't cement the reasons why and if it doesn't cement the reasons why what is the point I don't want to just see his spiraling emotions I want to know why so I struggled with that quite a lot there were two endings to this play I'm not sure which is the ending you see in the typical book that gives you one ending but there was one ending I liked more than the other because it gave the character more autonomy and responsibility for his actions that he does throughout the play and there you have it. Those are the 30 books I read in the month of April and what I thought of them. Please let me know in the comment section down below what was your favourite read in the month of April. Have you read any of these and what did you think of them? Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Hit the subscribe button if you want to see more and don't you forget to hit that notification bell to be updated every time I have a new video and you know what they say. Onwards and upwards. Excelsior!